This conference will now be recorded. Sorry. Liberty Hall is a beautifully housed resource for information on the American Revolution, as well as a space for public events and ceremonies. And we're grateful for their participation in today's event. Before we begin, I'd just like to mention that on Monday, December 13th, we have a program titled Christmas and the Winter Solstice that explores the history of Christmas traditions. And on Thursday, January 6th, we have a program titled Canna Business or Cannabis Business about the history and upcoming regulations of cannabis in New Jersey. We also have many other programs you can learn about at mcl.org. And with that said, please welcome our guest speaker, Hannah Gaston. Thank you so much. I truly enjoy the opportunity to speak with you folks tonight. And let me just get my slides. Oh, goodness, goodness gracious. Let me get my uh, slides going. I really I enjoy the opportunity to speak to you folks tonight. I am happy to get to share a little bit about Liberty Hall and the resource that we are with you folks. So let's jump into our program tonight. Uh, Liberty Hall is a historic house and gardens museum located in Union, New Jersey, right on the campus of Kane University. We were built in 1774, and, and our first resident of the home was William Livingston, who was the first elected governor of the state. Now, he served as governor from 1776 until his death in 1790, but after his death, the history of Liberty Hall does not end there. In fact, it continues all the way to our very last resident, Mary Alice Barney Kane, who passed away in the home in 1995. So we really cover 200, 250 years of history, New Jersey and American history here at Liberty Hall. Now it was Mary Alice's dream to turn her home into a museum. And so when she passed away in 1995, she did just that. Today we have about 15 uh, acres of gardens and grounds on our property, as well as about 15 to 20 period rooms that tell the story of the house's history from its colonial roots all the way to the modern era. Here in this image, we see our Victorian era dining room. And last but not least, we have um, a number of outbuildings on the property that, uh, again, tell the story of who we are. So we have a privy and an, a smokehouse, an ice house. This is our visitor center, which is, we call this the blue house. We have a firehouse museum. We have a wagon shed. Uh, you name it, we have it here at Liberty Hall. But tonight, I'm not going to focus too much on the history of the house itself. I mean, we're going to talk about some of the people who lived in the house. But tonight, I want to focus on quilting and how quilting relates to women's history and how quilting helps us as historians tell the story of women. Now, of course, quilts are practical. They provide warmth and they provide comfort. Um, but they're also a way that we can express ourselves creatively and emotionally. Think about baby quilts or, or wedding quilts. And quilts have been a part of American history really since colonial times, all the way through history to the very famous and uh, romanticized quilting bees of the early 1900s, even to today. And quilting has been a way that women have used their tools and their resources to give themselves a voice, whether that's politically, whether that's socially, whether that's um, through the suffrage movement and the abolitionist movement, which we will talk about a little bit later, but quilting has given women a way to be a part of society, especially in times when society has not allowed women to really take an active role. So we will be looking at the history of quilting through the eyes of the residents at Liberty Hall, through the collections of quilts and embroidery work that we have at the museum and beyond. So I hope you folks um, will enjoy our presentation tonight. So we are going to start in the 1780s at Liberty Hall uh, when Liberty Hall is just, has just been completed um, in the middle of the American Revolution and immediately after the revolution. So let's meet some of the folks who are living at Liberty Hall at this time. So here we have Susanna French Livingston. She is the wife of William Livingston, who, as I said, was our first elected governor of the state. They actually have eight children. When they moved to Liberty Hall, all eight of those children moved with them as none of them were yet married. So the three daughters that would be most involved in quilting were Susan Livingston Sims, uh, Catherine or Kitty Livingston, and Sarah Livingston Jay. Uh, her last name is Jay because she ultimately marries John Jay, yes, the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. 
Now, during this time, uh, Liberty Hall also had a number of enslaved women and servants that were also working and living in the home. And unfortunately, unlike the images of Sarah and Kitty and Susan that I just showed you, we do not have images of these enslaved women. And in many cases, we don't even know what their names were. But we know that they would have occupied spaces like the colonial kitchen, like this space in the house, where they would have done most of their domestic work. So this is a space uh, for them. And just as much as the Livingston ladies would have been quilting and sewing, so would the enslaved people and so would the servants of Liberty Hall as well. Now, a colonial woman's uh, daily life was very hard work, especially for an average colonial woman who did not have a team of enslaved people or servants that were working underneath her. So the average daily colonial woman's life was very complicated. She had a lot of responsibilities that were very, very time consuming. Of course, child rearing and cooking are the obvious things that we think of, but women were also responsible for laundry um, and candle making, which we see there on that image on the right. That is a, a whole cabinet full of candle molds that we have here at Liberty Hall. And of course, women were also responsible for making cloth and making thread. Now, cloth and thread were actually quite expensive at this time. So if you could afford it, that was wonderful. But if you couldn't afford cloth, you were, had to, to find the time in the day to make it yourselves. Now, women had, as I said, many roles, many responsibilities um, in the home. And when we think of colonial era women, we often think of this idea of women sitting by the fireplace and, and stitching and, and you know, knitting and sewing quilts together. That's not really how women were sewing in colonial times due to all the roles and responsibilities that, uh, that were, were required of them. Now, most women learned to sew very early on, probably around the age of five or six, and they would have practiced their stitching and practiced their needlework with things like embroidery samples that we see here. Now, this embroidery sample was made by the woman that we see there on the right, Sarah Sabina Morris Kane, who eventually moves into the house uh, after her marriage to her husband. We'll chat about that a little bit later, but this is a great example of how women and young girls would have learned to sew. So of course, this embroidery sampler, it's a little hard to see because it was made in, uh, it was made in 1797, so it's quite old, and some of the stitching has faded quite a lot. Uh, but it has the alphabet, it has both lowercase and uppercase letters, it has um, numbers on it, and some of them even had prayers or poems. So it was not only a way for women and girls to practice their stitching, but it was also a way for them to practice the alphabet, their numbers, their prayers, um, Sarah even wrote her age. She's eight and a half years, eight years and six months old when she made this embroidery sample, when she made this embroidery sampler. This was a really, this was how women started to learn their skills when they were young girls at five or six years old. Now, sewing tools, sewing tools were also very valuable and important part of any uh, colonial woman's sewing kit. You had to have your needles and your pins and your, um, your scissors and things, but they were very valuable. Um, again, they were expensive. You might only have one or two needles for the entire household of an average colonial family. So you wanted to make sure you took very good care of those needles and kept them in some place safe. Um, this image that we see here is actually from Colonial Williamsburg, um, and these needles and these sewing objects were actually kept inside a hollow log. That was sort of their safe place to keep those objects. Now, as I said, fabric was very expensive back then. Um, cotton was not a what commonly used fabric, as, as many of our things are made out of cotton or a cotton blend today. But really, women were making things out of wool. And turning wool into usable cloth was a very long process that involved many steps. So it wasn't a quick thing. You can't just put something on a spinning wheel and spin it into thread and then you have thread and then you have fabric. That's not how it works. So there was quite a lot uh, to this process that women, again, were primarily responsible for. So step one, of course, is your raw wool, which is going to be sheared off the sheep. 
And as we see in this image, it's dirty, it's tangled, it needs to be washed, uh, it needs to be um, untangled. You have to get all of those knots out if you're going to spin this wool into thread. And so step two is cleaning the wool, skirting or sorting away the damaged pieces and soaking and washing the wool. Also during this part of the process, you would have to pick out all the little pieces of dirt or bugs or other fibers that were in the wool that were trapped in that uh, in the knots of the wool. This was actually something that very young children did. You could have a three or a four year old child picking out the little um, pieces of dirt in the wool. This was one of the very first things that young children were doing. This was one of their earliest chores would be to pick, it's called picking, uh, would be to pick out all of these, these pieces of dirt in the wool, these irregularities. Step three, we have to get the fibers into uh, a way that, a form that we can use them. They're too tangled and knotted right now. We need to get them uh, strung out so they're workable. So we need to card the wool. Now, of course, I'm sure we've all heard of carding combs as the image that we uh, see here. It's a little wooden board with little tongs on the top of it that's used to stretch out the fibers of the wool and brush out all of the tangles. This makes the wool become very soft and it also uh, allows the wool to be malleable so we can use it and spin it, and make it into thread. And finally, the last step is actually spinning the wool into thread uh, with the spinning wheel that we see here in this image. And then if you wanted to dye it or, or weave it, um, that would be the next step after spinning it into the thread. Now I have a video here uh, from Mount Vernon actually, that talks a little bit about the process of how wool uh, becomes thread. I'm not sure it's gonna work, but we're gonna try it. If it doesn't work, I'll just go into the next slide because I did get to explain the whole process too. But if the, if the video works, it's a really great explanation of this whole process that we just discussed. It froze for us, so we're not getting sound. It froze? Oh, sorry. Okay, well then you know what? Like I said, it'll just, I went through the process. It doesn't always work. Um, sometimes it works depending on what platform we're using, but we'll just go on to the next slide. It'll let me, there we are. Sorry about that. Like I said, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's kind of like a the luck of the draw, I guess. But as I said before, this brings us back to this question of, did colonial women really have time to sit and quilt like, like we think they do? You know, of course we have these nostalgic images, like the images that we see right here on the slide about, you know, women sitting next to a fire, uh, sewing or knitting or quilting. When we look at all of the other responsibilities that colonial women had to do just for daily life, we, we start to wonder, did they really have time to put into, into you know, painstakingly sewing these beautiful handmade quilts? Well, the answer is no. For most average colonial women, they did not have the time to create elaborate, beautiful designs in quilts like we think of quilts today. Most blankets back then were not quilts. They were actually manufactured and imported blankets. Many of them came from, uh, from Great Britain, especially for those uh, in the colonies today. And this is what most people were using because like I said, they just didn't have the time um, and the leisure time to quilt themselves. Another very common type of quilt, probably the most common type of quilt was something called a scrapped quilt. And this is a scrapped quilt uh, from the 19th century from our collection, but it's a good example of what they would have used in the 1700s as well during the colonial era. Now scrapped quilts, were when people used, as the name suggests, little scraps of fabric that um, they put together um, to make a quilt. Fabric, as I said, was very expensive. So you didn't want to waste it. So whether that was you know leftover clothing from a child they had outgrown or you know a blanket that had holes in it, you didn't want to throw the whole blanket away, you would piece it together to make a scrapped quilt like this. Another very common type of quilt is called a whole cloth quilt. Now this is really when you uh, you would weave fabric, you would weave thread, excuse me, into fabric, 
in big, long strips. If you look very closely at this image from this quilt from Colonial Williamsburg, you'll see it has uh, horizontal lines in it. And that it's not a fold, it's actually where the seams come together of big, long strips of fabric that were sewn together to make this whole cloth quilt. Now you may ask, like, why did they, why did they have these big, long strips of fabric? Well, that was actually a, a limitation of the loom, the size of the loom that, that whoever made this particular quilt was using. Of course, looms only allow you to make something so large. And so whoever made this quilt had a loom that only allowed him or her, probably a her, to make a strip of fabric. She could make it very long, but it had to be quite skinny. And so they then sewed them all together to make these whole cloth quilts that we see here. I love this quote that I found about, uh, uh, about quilting and how it affects women's history and how it relates to women's history. It says, quilts can be read as a women's history because their designs tell stories of the women who made them. And they are, a, they are symbolic of the larger American picture of which they are a part. So really quilts tell us a lot about how women are living at this time and what their life was like. We can learn by looking at these scrapped quilts and these whole cloth quilts, just how busy a colonial woman's life would have been. She wouldn't have time to truly make these elaborate quilts when we think of quilting. We don't get those type of quilts for quite some time in American history. So if we look at quilting, we get a good sense of who these people were, what their lives were like, and what they were doing, which is why I love quilting so much, because we can learn so much about the people who made them just by looking at the quilts themselves. Again, there's the, there is uh, the whole cloth quilt, another scrapped quilt from the Colonial Williamsburg collection, and just another whole cloth quilt that we see here. But this one, instead of big long strips, is in sort of rectangular or uh, square shaped pieces. All right, so we are going to jump 40 years into the future and look at the 1820s at Liberty Hall. So the Livingstons no longer live here, and now the Kane family has moved in. And remember that woman that I said made that sampler? Well, now it's our time to talk about her. Her name is Sarah Sabina Morris Kane, and uh, she is married to a gentleman named Peter Kane. We have no known images of Peter, but we do have a military uniform from the War of 1812 that belonged to him on permanent display at the museum, which we see here. So Sarah and Peter have three children, John, uh, Julia, who was my personal favorite member of the Kane family at Liberty Hall, you can ask me about that later, uh, and then her sister, Christine. So these three children and their parents are living here at Liberty Hall in the 1820s. After Livingston's death, the home was purchased by the Kane family and Peter and Sarah and their children move in. And this room that we see here, we call the Sarah and Peter Kane room. And this is a room that is set up to depict what their lifestyle would have looked like when they were living here at Liberty Hall in the early 1800s. Now, during this time, there's a lot of changes at Liberty Hall in the family that's living there. The Livingstons are out and the Kane family is in. But there's also massive industrial changes happening in the country right now. Of course, we have the start of the Industrial Revolution. And this is when we really start to see people shift from working on the farm to working in industrial settings like, uh, like factories and, and mills. And of course, we have a lot of inventions here that rapidly increase production, uh, decrease, excuse me, rapidly decrease production time and increase the supply and the amount of things that are being produced. Of course, one of the most important inventions and maybe the most impactful invention that happened during this time was the invention of the cotton gin by Eli Whitney in 1793. Now the cotton gin revolutionized how people were processing cotton. Pre the cotton gin, before it was, before its invention, one person could probably pick the seeds from about one pound of cotton today. And pardon me, I'm reading my notes, so I wanna make sure I get all these numbers correctly. Uh, correct, but with cotton gin, you could process, one person could process about 500 pounds of cotton in the same day. That is an exponential growth, that's unbelievable. Um, so the production of cotton has gone way up 
which means the price of cotton goes way down, which means people can now afford cotton. It's fabric is suddenly much more affordable and they don't have to string it and, and, uh, and, and spin it into, into thread and then weave it. That's, those steps of the process are taken out. Another thing that really benefits um, women and quilting and changes how that works is cotton mills and textile mills where fabric and thread are now being created on a, an assembly line by a machine and is no longer done by hand. This makes everything so much more cheaper and so much more attainable for the average American woman. Another textile factory image that we see here. Now, because of the decreased prices of cotton and thread and fabric, women start these creating these more elaborate style quilts that we typically think of when we think of quilting. Now, one, of, one type of quilts that came out in the early to mid 1800s was called pieced quilts. And this is an, uh, an, a sample of uh, a pieced quilt that we have at Liberty Hall made by Susan Livingston Kane in the 19th century. And a piece quilt was made, as the name suggests, by little pieces of fabric all sewn together. Now, most of them um, started with a star in the center and then built out. Susan's quilt here has our, our hexagons. She pieced together many, many little pieces of hexagons, uh, hexagon shaped fabric and sewed them together to build this design. Here's another design with that star shape in the center. And then the, the individual who built this quilt and made this quilt uh, sewed little individual pieces of fabric all together to make this larger star pattern from the individual, uh, the, the first star in that center. It's called the center medallion style, uh, that first star that sits right there in the center. Another type of quilt design that was popular during this time period were called applique quilts. So applique quilts are a little different than pieced quilts. You start with one large uh, piece of fabric instead of the individual pieces and build out. So with an applique quilt, you start with one large piece of fabric and you apply other pieces of fabric to it, thus the name applique quilt. So with this uh, example that we see here from the Smithsonian, um, the woman that made this quilt cut it out individually all those little flowers that we see here on the quilt and sewed them to the larger piece of fabric uh, that formed the base of the quilt. Now the woman that made this quilt again from Colonial Williamsburg cut out individual blocks of color. Instead of cutting out the birds themselves or the suns or the tree itself, she cut out from, uh, from plain fabric uh, blocks of color to make the shapes herself. So this was a different way of making quilts that actually allowed women to sort of um, uh, savor and save some of the fabric that they had. Fabric still was expensive, not nearly as much as it was, but it was still expensive. And so if you had a really pretty design, you didn't want to use the whole design for your quilt or for your blanket, you could just cut out little pieces of it for an applique quilt like we see here. And during this time, we start to get these quilting traditions. Um, for example, were young women expected to leave home with a baker's dozen of quilts as part of their dowry? Well, this is sort of a, an, an urban legend, uh, a quilting legend, if I could call it that, that women were expected to, when, by the time they got married, have made 12 utility quilts and one masterpiece quilt. So this is interesting because, of course, a utility quilt is something you're going to be using every day. It does not have to be pretty or nice like this image that we see here from the Smithsonian. The edges aren't even really straight, and that's fine. Then we have this masterpiece quilt, quilt this applique quilt from the Colonial Williamsburg collection, which truly shows off a woman's skill set, her sewing ability, her stitching ability, her artistic mind. But I think the really interesting thing about this is that we're now looking at quilting as an art form. If we have this idea of a masterpiece quilt that's different than a utilitarian quilt, this means that this masterpiece quilt is an art form. So now we're looking at what used to be strictly utilitarian, you know, a form of, of a blanket, a form of warmth. Now we're looking at it as an art form. So now women also have this way to express themselves artistically and society recognizes it 
as an art form, which is really exciting. And it's an exciting um, shift uh, of, of the mind. It's an, exciting way, it's an exciting way that society is thinking about, uh, is thinking about quilting. Another quilting little folklore that I, I discovered in my research, you know, is it true that the first person who fell asleep under a group made quilt would dream of their future husband or wife? Of course, this is the time when women and girls are getting together, you know, quilting bees, like we see in this painting here, uh, getting together, sewing quilts all as a group. It's a community effort. I love this painting because all the women and the children are sewing. And over in the left-hand side, there's a gentleman who's, I don't know, reading the newspaper or, or writing on his desk or something. And all the women are hard at work. But there was this idea, this, this you know, legend, this story amongst women that you know if you build a quilt together and you sleep under it you'll dream of your spouse i think it's just sort of a, a sweet um you know story passed down throughout the generations but it does say a lot about how women are building a community uh, amongst themselves around this project this love of quilting and being together to sew and then as I suggested earlier, women start saying to themselves, well, what if I use quilting to express myself, my voice, and to make a change, to make, uh, to change what I feel needs to happen in society, to express my opinions. We're using quilting now as both utilitarian and artistic purposes. What if we can take it to the next level and use it as a way to give us a voice? So this is when we start to see the growth of the women and the abolitionist movement, especially in the, uh, the as we head into the 1860s and the start of the Civil War. Now, women actually uh, were very involved in the abolitionist movement, which of course is the movement that is um, that that women created to and not just women, women were involved in to abolish slavery in this country. And women actually used their quilts as fundraising efforts for the abolitionist cause. So uh, here's an abolitionist quilt that's attributed to Lydia Marie Child, and uh, it's called the Cradle Quilt. Now this just looks like a very it's a beautiful piece of work, absolutely, but it's, it's a pretty simple quilt with these star patterns on them. But if we look very closely at the very center star of this quilt, you'll see there's actually a poem handwritten into this very center star. And I'll read you a portion of the poem right here. It says, think of the mother, her child is torn away, sold for a little slave. Oh, then for that poor mother pray. This is an abolitionist quilt. This is a quilt that is raising awareness and was probably sold to raise funding as well for the abolitionist cause. So women now are using this art form, which is truly and strictly given to women at this point in time to express themselves in a time when they didn't have the right to vote, they didn't have the right to be involved in politics, they didn't have the right to own property, but they're still using what they have, the resources at their disposal to give themselves a voice. So as I said, we're heading into the 1860s, we're moving closer to the start of the Civil War, and life at Liberty Hall is, is continuing on with a new generation of Canes living here. So the matriarch of the house is this woman, Lucinetta, or Lucy Halstead Kane. We also call her Mama Lucy because she has a daughter named Lucy as well. Now, Lucy is married to Colonel John Kane. Uh, we briefly met Colonel John a little bit earlier. Colonel John is the son of Sarah and Peter, who we spoke about uh, several slides ago. So Colonel John inherits the house from his father at his father's passing, uh, marries his wife, Lucinetta, who we like to call Mama Lucy, and they have nine children. Now, of their nine children, only three of them ever get married. So this means there are six bachelor and bachelorette children running around uh, Liberty Hall for their entire lives. And that includes three daughters. So let me introduce these women to you. And you've actually seen some of the handiwork of these women already. Susan Livingston Kane, I showed you an image of her pieced quilt we saw a little earlier. She's one of the unmarried Kane daughters, uh, Lucy Halstead Kane, 
and Elizabeth to Hopeville, who they called Bessie. So these are the three women that are living here at Liberty Hall in the 1860s, in the height of the Civil War, in the height of the Victorian era in, uh, in Europe and here in the United States as well. And this is just a typical room in Liberty Hall. It's set in this 1860s um, era. We call this the Red Room. This would have actually been Colonel John and Mama Lucy's master bedroom. Now, during this time, we have some new inventions that change how women are going to be quilting, that change the, uh, the access that women have to sewing. Um, and of course, that one invention is the sewing machine. Um, of course, this, as I said, revolutionized sewing, revolutionized quilting. And we even have a uh, Singer Treadle sewing machine at Liberty Hall from the early 1900s. Now this made sewing so much easier for women, so much faster. They no longer had to hand stitch everything. You could run it through your sewing machine. Um, of course, they weren't electric yet, but that's what the treadle sewing machine was for. Now, the interesting thing about sewing machines is that despite their convenience, many people, especially in the older generation at this time, didn't like them and, and protested them because they thought that with sewing machines, young girls and women would lose the art of hand stitching, stitching and they would lose the knowledge and the patience that it took to create quilts by hand or to create anything with hand stitching. And to some degree, I think they're right. Sewing is still, of course, an art form and a utilitarian for a uh, purpose today, but not many people hand stitch anymore. Really, you see things made on a sewing machine. So I guess to a certain degree, these women were correct in their concerns that people would lose the art of hand stitching. But because of the sewing machine, we get new patterns and styles of quilting. We start to see pieced block quilts, which are really the kind of quilts that are still made to this day. That when we think of quilting, this is the kind of quilting we think of. This is the kind of quilts we see, a pieced block quilt. Now these blocks, these, these quilts were made in a block by block format for a couple reasons. One, again, we have lots of different kinds of fabric that's very cheap. We have lots of different patterns and styles and textures and materials of fabric. Fabric's cheap, fabric's accessible. We can do lots of things with lots of different kinds of fabric. But why is it made in this block shape? Well, the sewing machine only allows so much. You only have a certain number of inches to work with between the arm and the needle of the sewing machine. So therefore, women started making quilts in these block shapes, block by block, because that fit in, into the confines of the sewing machine. So thus we start to see these pieced block quilts that we all think of when we think of quilting today. Now, women started making these pieced block quilts um, we, and we start to see so many different patterns and styles and um, uh, intricate patterns and designs that come out of these pieced block quilts. This is one of my favorite patterns. It's called a log cabin pattern. And people start naming these patterns. There are hundreds of different block patterns. Some of the most common nine square log cabin is my personal favorite, a wild goose chase. And then we see churn dash, drunkard's pass, path, double wedding ring, another personal favorite of mine. So we start getting named block patterns. And these block patterns are uh, then put in, into magazines and shared around the world and around the country. So now people can start making things like sampler quilts. This is the sampler quilt um, from the Bennington Museum collection. It's known as the Jane Stickle quilt. And it features 169 five inch blocks with a different pattern on every single block, a slightly different pattern on every single block. And it features over 5,000 pieces of fabric. 5,000 pieces were put together to make this quilt. And as I said, these patterns get shared. They get shared in things like the Godey's Ladies book which shares quilt patterns, shares quilt pattern names, shares stencils and samples. And we start seeing women from all over the country, whether they're in a farmhouse in the middle of Kentucky or they're in New York City, 
they can still make the same style quilt, the same style pattern, the same style embroidery, because they all have now access to the same resources. And beyond just patterns and, uh, and, and sharing patterns and ideas, women are now also sharing patriotic ideas. Because as we head into the Civil War, much of the sewing and quilting communities of the world shifts their focus to support the war effort, both on the Confederate and the Union side. And so this one we see here from the Godey's Ladies Magazine, we see quilting stars that are specifically designed to be patriotic. So women can include these patriotic features into their quilts during this time of up upheaval in the United States. Now, women were certainly involved in the war, uh, both from Liberty Hall and elsewhere, of course. Of course, they could not fight, but Christine Kane Griffin, the daughter of Sarah and Peter, who we spoke about a little bit earlier, she actually, um, her husband had just died, and she said, I want to be involved in the war. She volunteers as a nurse during the Civil War aboard the USS Daniel Webster, which was a hospital ship commissioned by the U.S. Sanitary Commission. Now these uh, sanitary commissions, these soldiers aid societies were very common during the Civil War. Many of them were started by women or were completely staffed by women, um, supporting the war effort in a number of different ways. But one of the ways they did that was they would hold sanitary fairs, which is probably something you folks have heard of, but these fairs were essentially giant fundraising um, opportunities. They would sell all sorts of goods and services, but quilts, handmade quilts, were a hot ticket item at these sanitary fairs, and they would often go uh, for, for the most. If that was the most expensive thing that could be purchased at a sanitary fair were these quilts. And women specifically made quilts with these patriotic themes, red, white, and blue, or here's one that is very reminiscent of the American flag from 1861. So we get this, this patriotic movement happening here during the Civil War that's very similar to what we saw during the abolitionist movement. Women were making and selling quilts in support of abolition. And now during the Civil War, women are making and selling quilts in support of the Union or the Confederate Army. And in fact, during the war, the military and the federal government encouraged women to make quilts, to continue this effort. And they actually asked women to make quilts that were seven feet long and four feet wide, because that was the standard size of a military cot and was easy to travel with a blanket that was that size. And over the course of the war, of course, those four years, it's estimated that women made over 250,000 blankets and linens just for Union soldiers alone. So now that we're heading out of the Civil War, we're gonna jump a larger jump in, in history and jump to the 1920s here at Liberty Hall. Who's living here now? Well, we finally reached our last resident, who's Mary Alice Barney Kane. Now she is living here with her husband, Captain John Kane, and their three children, uh, May. Her name was also Mary Alice, but you could not call her that. You had to call her May. Uh, Stuart Barney Kane and John Kane Sr., who is actually, yes, he is still alive. He just celebrated his 92nd birthday in the end of October. And here is a typical uh, style era room. We call this the morning room for this early to mid uh, 1900s time period here at Liberty Hall. And things have gotten with quilting have gone a little crazy, might I say, because now we have reached the era of the crazy quilt. This is a crazy quilt that we have in our collection. And crazy quilts, as their name suggests, don't have a pattern, don't have a rhyme or a reason, multiple different kinds of fabrics and textures. You wanna see the stitching on the outside. You don't wanna hide the stitching. Again, we're back to hand stitching now. You want it to be as chaotic and as crazy as you can make it. Now, while fabric was still inexpensive, ribbon and lace were actually uh, quite expensive still. So people would often make their own lace still, as we see here with our lace bobbin pillow. 
Now, unfortunately, with our lace bobbin pillow, um, it was never finished. They never finished this piece of lace that they were working on. And we don't even know who was working on this piece of lace. And the bobbins got all tangled. Uh, here's an image of a, let's me get to the next slide. Here's an image of the bobbin pillow that's not all tangled together. But I think the neat thing about our bobbin pillow is that it's a little time capsule. It's this unfinished piece of history and that, that someone here at Liberty Hall, was it Mary Alice, was it May, was it one of their servants, we don't know, was working on this and left it behind for us to look at and wonder. But this is also the time in women's history when we start to see the, the rise of the suffrage movement in the early 1900s. Of course, that happens. We finally get suffrage in 1920 with the passage of the 19th Amendment, but it took many years to get to this point. It started way back in the 1840s, but we finally got there in the 1920s. And so in the early 1900s, we see this movement really ramping up and we see this movement really taking hold in the country. And just like how we were and women were using quilts uh, to, to fight and support for the abolitionist movement and during the Civil War, this is also happening um, for, the, uh, for the suffrage movement as well. Women make suffrage quilts. Here's a crazy quilt from the Kansas Historical Society that's uh, specific to women's suffrage. Now, when you just look at this quilt, it may just look like a crazy quilt. It's beautiful, of course. When you get a really close look at it, you'll notice that this quilt is actually made up of little pieces of suffrage material. Maybe it's a sash, maybe it's a badge um, that have all been stitched together. And much of this quilt is made with these purple and gold hues, which were, um, which were the colors of the suffrage movement. So women in their quilting during this time often used symbols that everyone would recognize uh, that were in support of suffrage. For example, this quilt that we see right here, this center image right here is a very common icon of the women's suffrage movement from this women's suffrage poster made by Evelyn Ramsey Carey in 1905. So this was a very common image of women's suffrage. So this quilt maker who designed this quilt would have known that when anyone saw this quilt, they immediately knew what this quilt was advocating for. And this suffrage quilting movement hasn't ever really ended. Of course, we have the right to vote, but we're still fighting for many women's rights for equal pay and, and uh, access to health care. Um, so this quilting movement hasn't really ended. Uh, this is a 100th anniversary quilting challenge that took place in 2020 as we were celebrating the 100th anniversary of the right uh, of the right women's rights to vote passed to the 19th Amendment. And of course, women are still using quilting in other forms of activism as well. Here is a quilt seen at the Women's March in 2018 called the Feminist Quilt made by Darcy Reed. It, and the quilt itself reads, women's rights are human rights. This quilt, I always, I love this quilt, uh, made again for the 2018 Women's March, strong women taught us to quilt and to fight. So even though women now have more access to anything than they've ever had before, we're still fighting for many of our basic rights as women. And we are still using quilting, which of course has been a traditionally female assigned craft to make our case, to make our voice heard. Now, as I said, women uh, quilting has been a traditionally female assigned craft, but it is not anymore. Men are, are, are quilting and becoming contemporary male quilting artists, like this quilt we see here by Luke Haynes. And here's another patchwork quilt by Joe Cunningham, two male quilters who are using this beautiful form of art as their primary medium, as their primary artistic expression. Um, and that's, that's, an, that's a wonderful thing that now quilting has expanded beyond just women and everyone uh, is, is welcome to quilt today. And of course, quilting is now not just utilitarian. 
I loved when we started to see that shift from utilitarian quilting to both utilitarian and artistic quilting, but now quilting is a whole art form in and of itself and seen as an art form. Yes, of course, it is still utilitarian, but it is also still seen as an art form. There's even a National Quilting Museum. Guess what it exhibits? You're all right, quilts. Yes, absolutely. Uh, because we see quilting as an art form now. Um, it's not just utilitarian, it is true artistic expression. So quilting has such a long and rich history in the United States. But I think the most important thing to remember is that quilting tells the story of America. It tells the story of American women and how we have used the resources that we have at our disposal to give ourselves a voice, especially in times when we did not have a voice in society. And so folks, I would encourage you to become a member of Liberty Hall or come and visit the museum. Thank you for listening. I will open it up to questions and open up the chat uh, to any questions. And I would encourage you folks to come and visit us. We are all decorated for the holidays right now. Come and see the museum, all beautifully decorated. Um, and come and get a tour. Come and see some of these quilts that are on display. Learn a little bit more about who these people were that lived here at Liberty Hall. But if you folks have any question, uh, questions, I will open it up um, to questions. And I will open up the chat and see if there are any questions in the chat. Alice says, wonderful. Oh, thank you so much, Alice. I so appreciate that. Hannah, uh, yes. uh, can you tell us if there are any uh, contemporary quilters today, famous quilters we might be interested in learning about? Oh my gosh, unfortunately, I I don't know. I can think of quilts, <laughs> famous contemporary quilts, but I don't know that I, I could give you a name of a, a contemporary quilter today, unfortunately. Um, I can think of their quilts, but I unfortunately can't think of their names. Um, but that's a great question though. Um, uh, Mary just asked, are the Canes any relation to former Governor Kane? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so former Governor Kane, um, his cousins lived here and Governor Kane's father, Robert Winthrop Kane, who was a Senator, grew up here at Liberty Hall. So absolutely, uh, there's a picture of Senator, uh, excuse me, of Governor Kane in the, the very first room, the Great Hall of Liberty Hall. He's about six or seven years old and he's sitting in a little wagon and I love to point that out to people who would remember Governor Kane and say, look, there's Governor Kane. He's just sitting in the wagon. Oh, and yes, Dana said men have been sewing for centuries. Absolutely. Yes. And male quilts from the 1930s. Of course, men, yes, of course, have been sewing and quilting um, for centuries. But quilting really is an art form that is automatically associated with women, rightfully or not rightfully so. Um, but yes, of course, men have been sewing and quilting. Um, Absolutely. Um, but I think today we have such uh, awareness that it, it's an acceptable form of, of art for both men and women and people of all genders. So um, I, I think that's it, absolutely what men have been sewing, but uh, now today we have such a, a recognition of it. And Judith says, in very interesting program. Thank you so much, Judith. Any other questions from, um, from anyone? Yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, with all the new computerized and robotic technology, hopefully it still has to be a requirement for uh, quilts to be done by hand. Is that true or? Well, um, that's interesting you say that actually, because uh, with the process of quilting, um, of course you stitch all the individual pieces together, but then actually quilting it when you sew all the layers of the quilt so the top piece and the middle the individual the middle pieces and the back piece together that is often done actually by a machine uh, i have a good friend who um, owns a quilt shop and she has this, this enormous machine that she programs with a computer she programs a pattern into it and it's sort of sews and moves the quilt around in this pattern. And then of course it ends up with this beautiful design that has been quilted into this piece. She's the one that sews all the individual, you know, pieces together to make the, the, the colorful pattern. 
But when she actually quilts all the pieces together, that's done by a machine. Um, so I guess the answer to that is no, I guess, or maybe it's both. Um, there are still components that are done just with the sewing machine or by hand, but there are components that are certainly um, mechanized today and computer programmed today. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, does anyone else have a question? All right, well, I wanna thank everyone for coming. And thank you so much to our speaker, Hannah Gaston of Liberty Hall Museum. And thank you, Mary Bianco and Claudia for your comments that you're leaving right now. <laughs> and it was great to hear about quilting and all the stories that women were able to create and they're still creating now. Absolutely. And I hope you all will visit Liberty Hall, their website or in person. Thank you so much, folks. Everyone have a wonderful and safe evening and a very happy holidays.